Hey, well, welcome. All right, well, if you're new here, welcome to Redemption Park. We're glad you're here. If you have your Bible, let's get to work. Matthew chapter 13 is where we're at. Uh, we're in our series, The King and the Kingdom. Uh, right now, uh, Jesus is, uh, is the King. He's come from heaven and glory. He's established his kingdom. And his kingdom is his rule and reign. So, so where God's kingdom is, his rule and reign is being expanded uh, in our lives, in our hearts, in every area of our life. And so uh, at this point, Jesus is in, in this parable series where he's, uh, by story, telling the people what the kingdom is like. And so if you begin to work your way there, Matthew chapter 13 is where we're at this morning. Uh, as, I, as you go there, I was thinking of a, a story when I was a kid. Um, I, you know, I loved summertime the most because I was a latchkey kid. Any latchkey kids in here? No one? Okay. Yeah, a couple. Here we go. So that just meant uh, my mom went off to work and I had the whole day to myself. And there were no cell phones and uh, there were no play dates. I don't even know what that was. Like, uh, you, you know, you just look outside and see where the bikes are in the neighborhood and you go, or, or you go knock on the door and you say, let's, let's get this day started. And so you would go out there and, and th- th- there was no uh, texting. There was no cell phones. There, there was no safety at all. I had no bicycle helmets. Uh, we just built giant ramps and often went to the hospital as a result. Uh, but we loved it. And, and we we were just all over the place. Well, one day we, we were riding on our bikes and we saw another one of our friends, uh, but he was maybe nine, 10 years old. And, and he's like looking on the ground. He's searching for something. Clearly he's looking at his feet. He's, he's looking in the gutter. He's like getting on his hands and knees, looking up underneath cars and, and checking the tires. And, and, and so we roll up on our bikes and we're like, Chris, what, what, are, you, what are you looking for, man? He's like, uh, did you, did you lose something? He's like, no, I didn't lose something. Well, what, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for Bruce Springsteen tickets. We're like, did you, did you lose some? He's like, no, I didn't lose any, but I just really, really want to go. Bruce Springsteen tickets. Okay, so this is the mid-80s. I know you think I look 29, but I'm not. No, so uh, this is uh, 1985. He's looking for Bruce Springsteen tickets, and we're like, you... Did, wh- why do you think you're going to find the tickets here? He's like, well, I just really, really want to go. And, and this gives me at least some shot. And, and so we're like, okay, man, if we ride on and he continues to look. And, and I was just thinking about that this week as we look at these parables that, that in, in a few hours time, my, my friend Chris gave himself to Bruce, Bruce Springsteen's tickets more than many of us give ourselves to our eternal Destiny and the kingdom of God in a, in a searching kind of desperate kind of way. And, and so Jesus is going to come and he's going to reveal what the kingdom is like. And, and what you need to understand is that, that if, if discipleship was only about learning things about God, then, then Jesus would have said even about these parables, hey, uh, number one, the kingdom of God is valuable. Number two, uh, you, you need to repent of your sins. Like he would have just made propositional statements, but instead he tells stories and the stories are, invi- are, are an invitation for us to dwell on them, to, to let them roll around in our head and, and, and kind of enter into our hearts so that our whole being gets kind of captured by what he has for us. And so if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 13, I'll read these parables. So, so we've been in the parables, and, and the first one was uh, the soil. Be careful how you hear. Jesus says, how you hear the word of God uh, can set your foot on a path eternally one way or the other. So be careful how you hear. And then last week, Matthew taught on the, the parable of the weeds and the wheats. And, and he says, as the kingdom advances, the, the, weed is going to, the wheat is going to advance, but also the weeds are going to advance as well with that. And, and we actually end up praising God for that because the truth is that all of us at one time were weeds, but by the power of the gospel, and, and only as God can do, he can actually absolutely transform our nature from weeds to wheat. And so God is patient and, and he's bringing more people into the kingdom of God. And so we praise him for that. And now he comes to the end of his parables. I'll, I'll read it starting in verse 44. I'll ask you to listen carefully. This is God's word. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field 
which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is God's word. Let's pray. So, Father, we come before you now in the name of your Son and in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we're asking, Lord, that you would do a work not just in our minds, but in our hearts, in our lives. Lord, we desperately need, uh, need a word from you. We need a word of encouragement, uh, in some cases a word of rebuke and uh, a word of exhortation. We need a word of life. Uh, we need living water. We need spiritual bread. And so I pray now that you would bring those things to your church in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, Jesus is telling stories to spark your imagination, to get you thinking. What would that be like? In fact, uh, in the first century, this is not quite as crazy as it might sound in two ways. One, they would have all known merchants, and they can imagine a merchant who becomes obsessed with his wares, obsessed with pearls. It is said in the ancient world, that uh, Cleopatra had one pearl that would be valued at $4 billion today. And so they're like, wow, yes, there is a pearl. And so he tells this story. In the second story, he tells the story of this merchant who becomes obsessed and, and he's traveling and he, he, he just, he doesn't know what he's looking for, but he knows when he'll find it. He knows when he sees it, he'll know what it is. And so he begins to travel. Now imagine if you were that merchant, you're thinking there's something out there. There's something of, uh, of un imaginable value. I just have to get my hands on that. And so you travel from village to village, from, from country to country. You, you spend weeks on the open sea and you're just looking out at the ocean and you're thinking, there's something out there. there there's something of, of, of enormous value. Jesus says that when you begin to understand what the merchant is feeling there, you begin to understand, one, just the longing for, that God has put in your soul for something of inestimable value. And and so the the way Jesus tells the story is that, again, a kingdom of heaven is like the merchant in search of fine pearls. When finding one of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. He said, everything I have is worth getting that thing. This is what I've been living my whole life for. And so I sell it all. So, so, So the crowd could imagine this, that they could picture themselves in that. But But the story I really like, and the story uh, above, I I think you cannot understand the kingdom of God. You cannot understand the gospel. You cannot understand Jesus without understanding this parable. And I think so many people miss it. So he tells this story. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Again, this is not quite like trying to search for Bruce Springsteen tickets in the gutter. Because uh, this is actually a possibility in the first century. Uh, so uh, when there was no banks and safe deposits. There was no federal reserve. And so if you were a wealthy person and you saw enemies on the horizon, you would gather your family and you would say, we've got to hide this because if they come in, they'll, they'll take it all. And so you gather all your, your gold chains and your nose rings and your earrings and, and your gold plates and your silverware, everything. Maybe, maybe the whole town gathers all their stuff together and, and they put it in a chest and they, they look and they bury the chest. Well, depending on how, how vicious the invading army was, as they rolled in, maybe through calamity, through war, through sickness or death, the person bearing it and the family members and everyone are decimated and the treasure stays there. And so, again, as Jesus is speaking to the crowd, the crowd is looking at the hills and wondering, maybe somewhere out there, there is a treasure like that. And so he tells this story. He tells a story about this man who's walking through the field. Now imagine you're walking in the hot Palestinian sun and it, it's getting uh, late afternoon and, 
you've run out of water and you don't have any food and as you walk it's just kind of beating down and you've got a long way to go and so you say think to yourself I've got to get off the road I've got to do a shortcut I'll go through this field for the shortcut and so you begin to walk through the field and as, as the sun's beating down eventually you take a step and it's a hollow step and you take a few more steps and you're like well that that was weird and you, you don't have a watch because it's the first century. But nevertheless, you look at the sun, you look, and you're like, I got to get going. But I got, let me just look at this real quick. And you, you begin to move the dust away. And you're like, there's a corner of something there. You say, well, this is, a, this is, this is now interesting. And so you, you begin to uh, dig the dirt away. And, you, and an outline of a box begins to come. And, and you dig, and you dig, and you dig. And you realize, no, that there is something very much here. And, and, and you're still thirsty, and you're still hungry. But, but now you're, you're captured by what could possibly be there. And so you look around. You maybe find an animal bone or some rocks. And, and you begin to dig and dig. And for hours now you're digging. The sun is setting. And, and you're dying of thirst. But you, you just got to know. And eventually... You, you pull out this chest and you set it down. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And, and you, you crack off the lock or whatever it is. And, and you open it up and you just... That's not normal. Can you turn that off? Okay. That wasn't meant to be done. But I like it. I like it. And uh, you look in... And you cannot believe your eyes. You're like, shut up. Shut up. No way. Oh, no way. I, can't. I don't want anyone to know. Uh, what am I going to do? This, this is unbelievable. This is more than I could ever think or imagine. This is crazy. Well, okay. Um, it's late. Uh, one, I can't just drag this through. Uh, and I can't show up in town with, with more wealth than the whole country in this moment. Uh, uh, furthermore, whoever owns this field uh, owns w- what this treasure is. So, um, well, what do you do? Jesus says, here's what you're going to do. You're, you're going to put it back in the hole. You're, you're going to dig over. You're going to put the rocks back on it. You're looking for some leaves and some branches and you're going to put those over and you're looking. You say, okay, there's a tree here and the mountain's here and here's here. Okay, so got to remember tree, mountain, field, tree, mountain, field. And, and you go off. And how do you go off? How do you go back? Jesus tells us, and this is the key to understanding the gospel. Jesus tells us how he goes back. He says this, which a man found and covered up then in his joy. In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Why? Why joy? Maybe you thought the kingdom of heaven was like uh, following a bunch of rules. And, and, and maybe you thought the kingdom of heaven was like, hey, God doesn't want you to have any fun. But in the end, you get, at least get to go to heaven. Maybe you thought it was just about uh, doing well, doing good enough. No, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he covered it up. And then in his joy, he does what? He goes and sells all that he has, all that he has, and buys that field. Why? Because it's worth it. So imagine this man now traveling, gets, gets into the village late and, at night, uh, is looking for some water, gets some water, and, and, and people just see him grinning from ear to ear, and they're like, what's up with you? And he's like, I can't tell you, but do you want to buy my cow? <laughs> they're like, okay, what, uh, we'll buy your cow. And, and, and so maybe a few weeks go by, and hey, do you want to buy my house? Sure, we'll buy your house. Did you want to buy my, my boat and, and my fishing nets? They're like, but if we, if, we, if we buy your boat and fishing nets, how are you going to survive? Oh, I'll survive. Just, just buy my boat, please. And maybe his friends and family are concerned. Like he has lost his mind. Like what's wrong with you? You sold your cow. You sold your house. You sold your boat. Like something's wrong with you. And he's like, no, just trust me. And there's nothing wrong with me. Just trust me. Jesus says, when you start to understand what that man feels... You can start to understand what the kingdom of heaven is like. Isn't that so much better than saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is valuable? Now, there is this joy. Notice that when he has joy, it isn't like, oh, gosh, I got to sell my cow. I got to sell my house. I got to sell my boat. No. Every time he sells something, he actually gets a little bit happier. 
Sold my cow. I'm that much closer. I sold my house. Yes. He knows. Why does he know? Because he has anticipation. There, there is a longing. There is something uh, of such value that's going to just fill his life in, 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 in maybe a few weeks or months or however long it takes. But he knows it doesn't matter what it costs him. It's going to be worth it in the end. Does anyone look at your life and say, you're crazy. Oh, you're crazy that you're so happy and yet you're living so strangely. This is Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's valuable. So if I say to you, hey, I've got something. I want to sell it to you. It's 500 bucks. You'll be like, what, is that expensive or cheap? I, I want to know, is that expensive or cheap? If I, if I sell you this thing for 500 bucks, is it, you say, well, I need to know what it is. Well, it's a, it's a big pin, you know, ballpoint pin. Like, You're crazy. No, I'm not, I'm not giving you 500 bucks. But if you say, oh, it's a Ferrari, you'd be like, hold on, I'll, I'll be right back. I'm going to get the 500 bucks. And this is what Jesus is saying. Look, if it costs you everything, if you have to go full on sell out, if you lose everything in this life, and in the end you get the kingdom of God, your joy will be through the roof. Through the roof. So again, we can understand this intellectually. And one of the great tragedies of American Christianity is that we've made discipleship intellectual only. If you learn enough truth, if you put enough uh, verses in your head, then you must be mature. You must have really made it but what Jesus is doing in telling the story is saying, it's not just about knowing, it's about feeling, it's about your whole being being invested. It's your emotions, your joy, your hopes, your dreams. God wants it all for you to understand what discipleship looks like. So why is there dis disconnect? I think most of us, many of us in this room, can listen to Jesus' parable and say, yes, the kingdom of heaven is so valuable. It's just amazingly valuable. That's what's for lunch. I got a work project tomorrow. Can we wrap this up? I hope he doesn't preach too long. Why is there a disconnect? Where is the man or the woman who understands that, that if it costs you everything to pursue the kingdom, it is worth it? Where is the, where is the desperation? Where is a man or woman who just desperately wants to experience more and more of God in their whole life, in every area of their life? They want God's kingdom, his rule and his reign to express itself. Where is this kind of longing, a fasting, a, a crying out to God? Why, why are we content with a kind of shallow, surface level, we'll add Christianity to our buffet of options kind of life? You know, they're, they're, the psalmist, in Psalm 42, he, he, he says it like this. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you. We, we know this. We know this verse. Like many of you know this verse. Maybe you, maybe you got the t-shirt with the deer just like looking up at the moon. You're like, oh, that's so beautiful. But think about that. That's not beautiful. That's tragic. As the deer is desperately dying of thirst. I mean, that, that looks bad. Like, put that on your shirt. Dying deer. This is what he says. The psalm says, As the deer is panting for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you. I, I'm, just, I'm just so thirsty for knowing and experiencing more of God. Oh God, my soul thirsts for God, he says. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. So just through the night, he's just longing, pressing on. There's a desperation. And I'm asking if, if what Jesus is saying is true in the parable of the hidden treasure, why isn't that more of a reflection of who we are? Psalm 73, the same thing. Psalm, the psalmist at the beginning of the psalm in Psalm 73, he, he looks out at the world and he's like, God... Why, why do the wicked prosper so much? Why, why does it seem like they don't have any problems, but I've got problems? Why does it seem like they've got it all together? Why does it seem like they're blessed and I'm not? 
And then in the psalm, he, he comes into the presence. He comes into the temple of God, and, and eventually he has his eyes opened. And here's what he says in the end. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart might fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And do, do you hear the desperation? This is more of an echo of, uh, of Matthew 13, 44 than anything else. So, so why, again, why are we content with kind of the kiddie pool, warm water Christianity? Well, I, I think it's, it's because it's a struggle that we've always had. It's a struggle that Adam and Eve have. It's a struggle of, of really believing, is God for you? Does God really know what I want? Does God really know what I need? Is God holding out on me? And so our first parents, Adam and Eve, they, they, they believed the lie and exchanged the truth for a lie. And they said, we believe God is holding out on us. We're going to go our own way. And they gave up everything to get nothing. So, so it is kind of inherent in our spiritual DNA to, to question, to wonder and doubt. But, but there's, a, there's another reason. There's another reason why there isn't this kind of desperation that re- reflects Matthew 13, 44. And, and it is simply this. I think in, in our time, in our age, in, in Parker, Colorado, 2020, is God has bestowed on us a, a, a huge bounty of good things. Like, like it is a good, like our houses, man, praise God, they're, they're good houses. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting a a new car. That's that's nice. There's nothing wrong with wanting to give our kids the best. There's nothing wrong with getting our kids in in sports and activities. There's there's nothing wrong with saving for your retirement. There's nothing wrong with going on amazing vacations. All these things are very, very, very good things. But here's the problem. When good things become God things, the Bible calls those idols. Idols. And so it looks like this. It looks like uh, just holding our hands open and God has poured so much and we're like, wow, this is good. That's good. That's good. But, but if eventually our hands begin to close on them and we say, this is non-negotiable. Okay, Lord, I'll go wherever you want. I'll do whatever you want. But safety is, is the thing that is, uh, it's non-negotiable, God. I, 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 therefore, that's going to affect my whole life. I'm not going to go to the nations. I'm not going to risk my life. I'm not going to do any, but I'll do anything else, God. Or, or maybe you cl- close your hand on something else and you're like, God, whatever you want to do with my family, even my money, just the, my kids, my kids, I'm going to do what, what I want with my kids. So everything else, Lord, it's on the table. Everything else. And we have so many good things and our hands begin to just clasp around it. You know, in, in Ezekiel chapter 34, the elders of Israel come before God and God says, hey, they have idols in their heart. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, we, we've got these requests and God's like, hey, I don't want to talk to you about anything, but, but you're closed fist right now. And so we come to God and we're like, uh, God, I, I, want to, I want to come to you. And he's like, hey, what's, what's behind your back? What's in your hand? And Jesus is saying, if you only knew, if you only knew that the, the worth and the value of the kingdom, you would joyfully have open hands and open uh, lives to say, God gives and takes away and whatever you want to do with my life for the sake of the kingdom, I want to do. So, so that's the first thing. We, we've got to deal with our, our closed hand. Well, what is it in your life that you just grip so tightly and you say, God, you can have anything else in my life, but you can't have this. You can't have my career plans. You can't have my, my, my kids' uh, sporting events. You can't have my house. You can't have my vacation plans. You can't have my retirement plan. What is it, the thing that you just grip so tightly and God is saying, I want to talk about that because I want to take you to a place of unimaginable joy, but you won't get there with gripping these things so tightly. So, so here's two things that I know about you. One for sure. One for sure, of every human. It's the way God has hardwired us. I'll pull it up on the screen. The one thing that I know about you is that you desire to be happy. You want to be happy. Like whatever you do, every choice that you make, in some way, shape, or form, is, is shaped by this desire for happiness. And so uh, everything you buy, everything you do, the reason you're here today in some way, shape, or form is you are seeking your happiness. 
And the good news is, that's right. You should seek your happiness. That's how God created you. The bad news is you sell yourself out. You sell yourself out. You, you go far too short for the kind of happiness that you could have. You settle for too much. So in the most overquoted uh, quote from C.S. Lewis in the history of C.S. Lewis, I, 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 I tell myself I can do it once every two years. Uh, he says this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So you want to be happy, but you're too easily pleased. You want to find satisfaction for your soul, but you're too easily pleased. And, and, and honestly, we have a lot to choose from to please ourselves. And so we just gorge ourselves on the junk food of this world. But there's a second thing that's true of you, especially if you have the Spirit of God in you. The first one is you want to be happy. The second one is you want to glorify God. Like there's something in you that says, I want my life to glorify God, especially if you're a follower of Christ. I, I think just by virtue of being an image bearer, you have this, but, but if you're a follower of Christ, the, the Bible says you have the Spirit of God living in you, and, the, and, and there's this desire somewhere, maybe latent, maybe, maybe small, but you feel it somewhere. I want to glorify God. Now, here's the deal with these two options. The enemy is going to come, and the flesh is going to come, the world is going to come, and it's going to say, these things are at odds. You can have one, but not the other. And so Satan's going to say, since you can only have one, you might as well choose happiness. That, that's what you should choose. And so just go this way. And so that's what our first parents thought and believed. Well, we're going to choose happiness as to glorifying God. But Jesus is going to come along and he's going to say, these things are not at odds. They go hand in hand. In fact, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have one without the other. This is what the parable of the hidden treasure is. You want to be happy. You want to glorify God. Well, they go together. And so uh, the Westminster, Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number one. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's the purpose by which you live. And then someone like Pastor John Piper will come along and say, not just that, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That's why in His joy, He goes and sells everything and buys that filled. They are one and the same. There's still going to be a, a tension in your soul to wrestle with those things. But how, how do we get there? How, how do we actually make progress in this? How, do, how does the, the, the parable really take root in our lives? I, I think there's, there's four things. And the first one is just this. We need new eyes and new hearts. New eyes and new hearts. That's, that's just what the Bible says, that, that we are dead in our sins and transgressions. Ephesians chapter 2. That, that, that we are blind, that we are deaf. And so this is the work of God by the Spirit of God uh, applied to us in the gospel of God. So Jesus Christ left his throne in glory. He left everything to give us everything. And, and on the cross, he exchanged what you deserved for what he deserved. And, and he gave you his righteousness and he conquered death in the grave. And as he did that, by grace through faith, you can come to him. And the Bible says, if you come to Christ, you are a new creation. Galatians 2.20, the old is gone, the new has come. You have new eyes. You can't do this on your own. You can't work this up. You can't do an, enough spiritual things. God has to give this to you. And he offers that to you by grace through faith. So you get new eyes and new hearts to see. If you have new eyes and new hearts, then you can begin. Number two, we need a disciplined pursuit of seeing and savoring King Jesus. Uh, This is is something that I think we just miss often in American Christianity. We wake up and are victims of our circumstances. Is it going to be a good day or is it going to be a bad day? This is not how the Bible describes discipleship. The one that understood the treasure of Jesus more than anyone, I think, in the history of the world is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, he he put it this way in his letter from a Roman jail cell to a church in Philippi, 
Listen to what he says. Listen how he understood the parable of the hidden treasure. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish or dung in order that I may gain Christ. He'll go on in verse 12 and he'll say, not that I've already obtained all of it or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. There is an intentionality to seeing and savoring Jesus. He is reminding himself. Remember, the guy who went in his joy and sold everything, it was because he had anticipation. He had to remind himself, there's a treasure waiting. This is why I'm selling my cow. There's a treasure waiting. This is why I'm selling my house. That There was anticipation. So, so discipleship is about uh, renewing your mind to the anticipation that all that you have in Christ. It's not just being a victim, like, oh, it's a good day or it's a bad day. I had a good day at work or a bad day. It's like, no, regardless of what happens in this world, I know I have a treasure. I know I have the king and the kingdom on my side. And so you remind yourselves of those truths. I think uh, one of the best books on this comes from a guy named James K.A. Smith. He, uh, I got the quote up here, in this book, You Are What You Love the spiritual power of habit. This is, this is being disciplined. And th- this is what I want us to take away as, in terms of discipleship. He says, discipleship, we might say, is a way to curate your heart to be attentive to and intentional about what you love. To be intentional about what you love. And so this is a, a disciplined pursuit of seeing and savoring Jesus. Number three, we need to seek the kingdom in every area of our lives. If the kingdom of God is God's rule and reign, then we, then we can apply that to every area. What would God's rule and reign look like in your marriage? How, how might that change the way you interact with each other? What would God's rule and reign look like in your parenting? If God is ruling and reigning in you and through you, what would God look like in your workplace if his rule and reign went with you wherever you went? I mean, whatever it is, what would, God, what would it look like uh, in your generosity if God's rule and reign was, was, was on the throne and not your own desires and will? I mean, again, you just apply it to every area. As a student, as a single person, as a married person, as a kid, as uh, an athlete, uh, what, would God, what would it look like if God's rule and reign took over this area of my life? And then finally, I think if we are going to understand this and wrap our hearts and our lives around this, we need to pursue the king and the kingdom together. Together. Like, this is what Jesus has called us on mission together to, to seek and savor Jesus and to make him known in the nations. You, you want to really set your joy uh, on fire for God? Begin to serve alongside other brothers and sisters. Begin to take the gospel to your friends and your neighbors and, and, and come back and tell those stories. That's for your joy. And so we. We gather, we remind each other, we, we're doing this together. We, we gather in our gospel communities and, and we pray for another, one another. We remind each other. We, we gather in our core groups. Those are, two or th- those are three people gathered together uh, in mutual discipleship where we, we check in on one another and we, we ask each other, how are you doing? And we confess our sin and we, we, we spur one another on towards love and good deeds. You are fooling yourself if you think you can pursue the kingdom by yourself. And so to the end that God is glorified and the nations are satisfied. May he do that work in us. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the kingdom of heaven. Lord, give us that joy. Remind us of the inheritance we have in Christ. Remind us that in Christ, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Remind us that this life is not all there is. Remind us that there is a treasure that is worth giving everything for. Lord, give us open hands for you to give and take away and let us not grip anything too tightly in this world. And then, Lord, send us out for the glory of God and the joy of all people. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.